Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Washington Institute. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, periodically, members of our senior research staff fan out across the Middle East uh, to focus on areas of their, uh, their concern, their interest, their specialization. And we've always found that some of our, um, from feedback from people like you, that some of our um, uh, most interesting events um, are opportunities for our scholars to talk about what they've just learned, uh, the impressions that they return home with, what's fresh in their mind. And since um, uh, quite a few of us have been traveling in the last couple of weeks, we thought this would be a good opportunity. Um, uh, I just uh, returned um, over the weekend from um, uh, a trip to Jordan, the West Bank, and Israel. Um, Andrew returned uh, recently from a trip to uh, Lebanon and Turkey. Um, and Simon returned just this uh, weekend as well from a trip to Bahrain. Um, and uh, so between the three of us, we cover quite a bit of ground in the Middle East, not everything that's going on in the Middle East. There's a whole um, a very important chapter of what's going on in Egypt, which uh, was not on our itinerary. Um, a whole very important chapter of what's going on inside Iraq domestically, which was not on our itinerary. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of today's discussion, I do think there's, there's still quite a bit um, of territory that we did cover and quite a few issues that, uh, that came up in our various conversations that we think would be useful to share with you. Um, uh, so I'm going to open with uh, some remarks and turn to Andrew. Uh, and, then, and then turn to Simon. Um, I hope that uh, um, uh, the three of us are well known to you. Andrew, of course, Andrew Tabler, um, is uh, uh, um, one of Washington's leading experts, if not um, uh, with the greatest insight into Assad Syria than, than anyone else uh, um, uh, in Washington. Um, uh, uh, Andrew is um, a uh, frequent um, uh, uh, fixture uh, on the media, on Capitol Hill, um, in the government, uh, providing really ground up, granular insight into who is the Syrian regime, who is the Syrian opposition, and uh, where is this conflict going. Um, and his visit to Turkey and to Lebanon was, a, was an excellent opportunity to meet with the Syrian opposition, um, uh, armed and unarmed, and to learn about uh, the dynamics of this ongoing conflict. Simon is, the, of course, the director, is our Baker Fellow and the director of our Gulf and Energy Policy Program. Um, uh, uh, he's been watching uh, events um, in the Gulf for many, many years now, uh, particularly with, a, with an eye through the lens of Bahrain because of the, um, the confluence of the internal struggle between regime and opposition and, of course, the, the, uh, the strategic interest the United States has. Uh, in Bahrain, and so that's a that's an excellent platform to look at uh, um, and, uh, developing uh, um, uh, developments in the Gulf. And so um, I'm very glad that you came, you went there, and can come back with your report. Um, I went to Jordan and Israel in the West Bank. Um, uh, I had, um, uh, I'd like well, first let me, I'd like to thank. Uh, some of my hosts um, who were very helpful on this trip, especially the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Jordan, um, uh, my fellow Duke alumnus, uh, Stu Jones, our ambassador in, uh, in Jordan, um, uh, um, the Jordanian government, which is uh, very helpful in facilitating some of my meetings, um, uh, also Dan Shapiro in Israel, uh, a friend of long standing, um, uh, and um, I had the opportunity to meet uh, um, you know, high level, I'm not going to name names, uh, but let's just say very high level um, Jordanians, uh, uh, government, uh, uh, royalty, um, opposition, intelligence, uh, you name it. Uh, on the Israeli side, I uh, met most cabinet ministers who speak English. Not They all don't, but uh, most of them do. Um, uh, military, uh, political opposition, political leadership. Um, um, I also, um, a subtext of my trip was, um, uh, was visiting universities. I visited uh, universities in Jordan, Israel, and the West Bank um, on a 
kind of a sub theme of trying to understand public diplomacy and and how we're doing with the university students and on campuses in various places and i'm happy to make a few comments about that later on in my talk um but the reason why i went to jordan is because i didn't want to be surprised um uh in 2012 like so many of us were surprised in late 2011 uh, and in late 2010 and early 2011. i wanted to know whether or not uh, uh, jordan was going to be infected or or victim of um, the spread of uh, um, uh, the Arab uprisings, which have touched so many other countries in the Middle East. I basically went to Jordan with three questions. Um, one, um, uh, is Jordan um, about to be overcome by a tsunami of uh, Arab uprising as hit other countries? Uh, two, vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis Syria, um, is Jordan willing to and considering playing the role vis-a-vis -vis Syria uh, that it played vis-a-vis -vis Iraq a decade ago. Namely, is Jordan willing to be a platform for international efforts um, uh, um, in, uh, in Syria? Uh, and three, um, how is Jordan prepared for what looks like to be uh, the long-term irresolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Um, a, a conflict whose um, uh, a, a solution to which certainly does not look like it's uh, um, forthcoming anytime soon. Um, let me read you a paragraph about Jordan that I think is appropriate. Uh, quote, uh, all is not well in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Among other problems, Jordan is beset by a growing economic crisis, rising unemployment, and the danger of a confrontationist Islamic political movement. And because of the special role and visitors for Jordan, in America's Middle East policy, the United States is ill-prepared to deal with the portentous changes going on inside the kingdom. Um, that paragraph is um, uh, not too dissimilar from the following paragraph, which is, quote, something is brewing in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. It's not so much that protests have been spreading. The country has experienced these before. It is rather who is behind them and from where dissatisfaction comes. East bankers who've long formed the pillar of the regime, the pillar is showing cracks. Um, the authorities retain several assets, but in a fast-changing region, they would be reckless to assume they can avoid far-reaching change and turmoil. Well, the first paragraph comes from a book that I wrote 20, um, 27 years ago called Troubles on the East Bank, Challenges to the Domestic Stability of Jordan. It's the opening paragraph. And... Um, uh, uh, it, um, by, you know, I just, I got lucky with this. It presaged, um, uh, by just two years, the, um, mass protests, um, among East bankers, which forced the King, um, King Hussein to fly back, uh, from the middle of a, um, a trip to Washington, change his government, and led to, uh, for the first time ever, led to, um, a political opening and eventually, uh, these, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, took for the first time seats in Jordan's government. Um, and this was a major shift in Jordan's uh, uh, political trajectory. The second paragraph is the opening paragraph of an international crisis group report, which came out um, just uh, two weeks ago about Jordan. And my own sense is that uh, there are indeed remarkable similarities between the situation in Jordan today um, uh, and the situation that uh, King Hussein faced in Jordan in the late, uh, in the late 1980s, which, which compelled him to make what at that time was unprecedented uh, political change. And basically it goes like this. The old compact in Jordan is under intense pressure. Uh, under intense pressure from both sides. And that's what makes this uh, current situation so um, potentially flammable. Uh, for the kingdom. Uh, for the first time in many, many years, uh, the East Bankers, the Transjordanians, um, are themselves protesting against the monarchy and protesting against their situation inside Jordan. Uh, the Arabic term for this is Hirak. It comes from Haraka, which movement. There are a series of movements um, uh, in each of the, those small, sleepy East Bank towns um, which uh, most of us knows very little. Tefillah, Ma'an, Karak, 
Um, these towns have, in fact, been quaking with protests um, in recent months, um, uh, or at least what, uh, for in Jordanian terms, pass for quaking, which are hundreds of uh, young men, usually, but not only. Last week had the first all-female protest in Tefila, um, coming out protesting against the regime, protesting against uh, uh, the lack of jobs, about the lack of un uh, the lack of employment, um, uh, and, uh, the lack of attention. They think the regime is just dis displaying to them. On the other end of the spectrum is a very dangerous evolution in uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan. Now, traditionally, the Muslim Brotherhood has a very ambivalent relationship with the regime. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood at times have been supportive of the regime, at times have been opposed to the regime, but traditionally the Muslim Brotherhood is not anti-regime. Um, that has changed in the sense that the Muslim Brotherhood itself has changed. The generation of Muslim Brotherhood leaders that um, people here may have known um, uh, is passing. Uh, that's, an, that's an East Bank-led accommodationist Muslim Brotherhood. And in its place, and we have seen this, you can see this in internal Shura elections which have just gone on in the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, in its place is what is called the Hamas wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. More Palestinian, but, but even among the East Bankers in the Hamas wing, it's much more radical. And they are riding the tide of the regional trend. Uh, uh, the regional trend, we saw what's happening in Egypt, we see what may be happening in Syria, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan sees that history is moving in its direction. Now, um, uh, a, a more antagonistic Muslim Brotherhood, which masks and covers up um, this distinction between East Bank and West Bank, combined with a disillusioned uh, and more antagonistic group of East Bank loyalists is you know, the ultimate nightmare for, uh, um, for the regime. Now, uh, in my view, where this is going, well, one sentence first. To put this in context, um, uh, one has to understand that Jordan is um, different than every other, um, every other country in the, in, in the Middle East in the sense that the word reform, the very word reform, means something different depending on who you are. If you lived in almost any other country in the Middle East, and you heard the banner of reform, it would mean something very straightforward. It would mean the transfer of political power from the centralized authority outward. That's what reform is. Distributing political power from the people who have it to the people who don't. Maybe not fully, but partially. In Jordan, that's not what this is about at all. If you're an East Banker, political re uh, reform means Stop giving all the jobs to the Palestinians and put more money into bigger and bigger state enterprises that hire more and more East Bankers. If you're a Palestinian, reform means open up your political system so that it's not gerrymandered to benefit the East Bank and give more and more um, voice to the majority of uh, Jordanians who are of Palestinian origin who are denied through parliament and other means political voice. So depending on where you sit in Jordan, the very word reform is defined differently. So to say that you're pro-reform means nothing. It really is what kind of reform do you advocate for? Now, my own view is uh, over the past year, there has been a remarkable opening of closed files in Jordan, something which um, people who followed this country for many years did not expect to see. Let me just read you a paragraph from a, um, uh, an op-ed in the Jordan Times a week ago about the year that has passed in Jordan. Among the most important red lines that have been crossed over the past year are budgeting for security and auditing and monitoring of the security budget, the Jordanization of the public sector and the Palestinization of the private sector, political rights of citizens regardless of their origins, economic rights 
versus the unchecked spending of the executive authority. The dismantling of the elite class of financial, political, and security heavyweights. The moral legitimacy of the Islamic Action Front, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, versus the lack of independence of the three monitoring agents of government, the media, the judiciary, and the parliament, and the list just goes on and on. These are normally files that are closed in Jordan, and they are now all open. Now, where is this going? My own view is that the East Bank problem is deep, it's real, it's severe, but it's soluble. It is unprecedented, but it can be solved. It takes more assets, it takes some flexibility on the part of the regime, and the, it is the first order of business if the regime is going to solve any of its problems, it's to put its core base at ease. Because the Ikhwan problem is much more serious. The Ikhwan problem is a problem of regional events and how regional events can float into Jordan and carry it away with the tide. The kingdom's strategy right now is to get the Ikhwan into the political system today. Today. This week. This month. Because it knows that if it waits six months, eight months, ten months, events in Syria might improve the leverage of the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, if, uh, uh, if this is, I'll, I'll say this at the end of my remarks, but I think, just to give a quick headline, the pace of change in Syria is to me one of the most important factors um, affecting the stability in this entire region. The pace of change. A slow change is a disaster. A slow change in Syria um, uh, is much more likely that uh, um, if that when Assad goes, a slow change is much more likely that it's a radical successor, a, um, the, that the Salafi element in the opposition is more influential, that whatever responsible actors are keeping an eye on the CW in Syria are less likely are able to do this, um, that uh, uh, that is much greater chances of a deep sectarian crisis that the Ikhwan um, in, uh, in Jordan, uh, for example, gets hugely emboldened by the success in Syria, and the pressure on uh, the Jordanian regime goes um, uh, much, much higher. So, um, uh, my own view, it's extremely important for the Jordanians to lock the Muslim Brotherhood in now as quickly as possible. This is what their strategy is. And the regime is paying uh, a dear, dearly in terms of public opinion for what is viewed as um, almost unnatural outreach to the Muslim Brotherhood. But the unnatural outreach, um, and this is uh, the, the prime minister is the object of this derision for everything he's trying to do to bring the Muslim Brotherhood into the political system now. This, uh, this, this outreach is so as to limit the damage later on when they see that the outcome in Syria is going to be very negative for their interests. The economic situation in Jordan is, ter is very unsettled. It's not so much the urgency of debt, Jordan is not Greece, it's the fact that there's just not enough money to go around, and the Jordanians aren't even being very um, self-interested in, in how they always act. Uh, the Jordanians are spending an extra billion dollars, for example, um, because all these pipelines keep uh, keep blowing up um, from Sinai to uh, uh, to Jordan, so they they spent an extra billion dollars last year on getting their energy from uh, from the east. The Israelis are offering to sell them gas starting in uh, in two years from now at a at a at a very attractive price, but the politics of doing business with Israel in Jordan is about as bad as the politics of doing business with Israel in Egypt. And that's a very sad situation because it restricts even the self-interest of Jordanians from coming to the fore. Um, again, key question I leave Jordan with is Syria. King Abdullah came out early saying that if he were Bashar, he would leave. 
and jordan has opened itself up to refugees not as many as i think some of the reports have suggested but i do think there's credible reports of thirty between thirty and forty thousand i'm syrians that have come over the border the real question is whether jordan will openly or quietly play the role of these of the syria like it played these of the iraq a decade ago situations of course are not the same not least because the u.s government is ambivalent on the issue but the saudis and the carteries on on uh, ambivalent and they're pushing for access to funnel arms material and money to the opposition in my conversations not a single jordanian was enthusiastic about playing a role vis-a-vis -vis syria but then um, nobody has yet come and offered them uh, a lucrative uh, inducement to play such a role um, i think that if someone does come and offer them that lucrative inducement um, i believe that they will seriously consider this um, uh, uh, because of their economic situation but i can tell you if the jordanians choice is between having uh, if the regime's choice is between having a genocidal killer like bashar staying in power killing another 10 20 50 000 of his people or a year two years from now having a specter of a more radical ikhwani even salafi tinged opposition um, as the dominant force in jordan in syria they'll take the bashar alternative because of their own self-interest this i think is a dynamic that we need to change and is part of the urgency of changing the pace of change on on uh, on syria but just a couple of quick remarks about israel um first real deep consternation at the highest level at what they saw after the prime minister's visit to washington as leaks coming from our capital that in their view were designed to undercut the president's commitment that Israel has independent action, the right to sovereign act, independent action vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, I cannot underscore how um, deep and visceral the, uh, the comments about uh, um, the leaking um, from Washington was. Um, connected to that is frustration that Washington seems to think that Israeli posturing is the root cause of higher gasoline prices, when in Israel's view, uh, the Iranians have successfully, successfully figured out how to, how to turn warmongering in the Straits of Hormuz into greater revenue for themselves. Um, uh, and th for which the Israelis, in Israel's view, are being held responsible. Um, uh, they think, in fact, the Iranians should be held responsible for the higher gasoline prices. Uh, thirdly, more generally, you know, I spoke to almost everybody who's involved in this Iran debate in Israel. And I found that it is a serious professional debate. There, there is not a single sort of macho moment that I had with any leader in Israel about, about this. This is, this is the, the, the gravest, most sober debate that I've ever seen Israelis have. Uh, and the debate is not about capabilities. I met no high-level Israeli who expressed doubt or concern about their own capabilities. The debate is about the connection between possible military action and the ultimate strategic obje objective. What is the connection between possible action and convincing Iran to ultimately give up its military nuclear program? And like so many other debates, it ultimately ends up back in a discussion of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Because for no one is the idea that military action alone sufficient to achieve that strategic objective. Uh, the Israelis, I found, were divided on almost every issue I spoke with. Put aside uh, not just Iran, but even even a basic question like Egypt. Um, take the question: You know, is um, uh, uh, is the success of the Muslim of the new civilian leadership in, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, is the success in Israel's interest or the failure in Israel's interest? Is it better for Israel to have a successful experiment of Muslim Brotherhood rule, which might be a terrible antenna for attracting other such rule elsewhere in the region? Or is it worse for Israel to have a failed state of 88 million people on its border, 
with all the attended negative consequences that they meant that that might have israelis were of multiple minds about this parent that equally the one issue on which there was very little debate is the palestinian issue uh... the general consensus is that the calm that currently exists will stay for the foreseeable future security cooperation is good economic and business cooperation is good uh... and for all the posturing from abu mazen and uh... his uh... his coterie they're doing nothing to change either the economic or the security cooperation um, uh, i have my own uh, doubts about this i don't think it's all going to be good forever but um, uh... that was the general consensus and i'm happy to talk in q and a about my own first-hand impressions of um, sort of uh, the, the rise of hamas um, even on university campuses which i was quite struck with um, uh, so uh, Look, let me, let me just conclude again with, with a final comment. Um, I, I came away from my discussions everywhere um, um, with the sense that a variable about Syria is not fully, um, uh, is not fully um, appreciated here in Washington, uh, which is that the pace of change matters so much. A slow grinding process in which maybe a year or two years from now Assad goes, that is horrible. That's the worst of all possible options, it seems to me. And so uh, the idea that people in Washington, which have now begun to adopt, Assad will go, it will just take time. That's like not taking a position at all. And that's like ensuring that the worst option, um, a Salafi-tinged opposition in a sectarian Syria with the total demise of the Syrian army and any responsible actors in, in the country, that almost ensures that that worst option comes to pass. There are a lot of ways I think the United States, working with its allies in the region, can help hasten the pace of change. And uh, I'm sure that Andrew will go into some of this, and I'm happy to offer my views on that as well.